Bleach chapter, motherfuckers! Wow, I... I don't know how to feel about all of this. From Burn the Witch, and how fabulous that's been, to a brand new chapter of Bleach? Like, I, I don't even know how to feel about this. And this is no one-off. This feels like the start of something new. And I love the way this opens. It opens in a very Kubo-esque way. Where I think it's Ichigo's son giving a bit of a monologue about, you know, Kazooie just needs to find Banjo. But <laughs> Kazooie talks about these two goldfish that he had. And whereas one grew bigger, but it ultimately ended up dying. And he thought that it, the other fish would end up lonely, but he simply ended up growing bigger. And he thought, good f it's a good thing that the larger one died. Which ominously kind of sets up this chapter. And for the most part, it opens up innocently enough. Orohime checks on Kazui, and we see that Kon is kind of a babysitter for their child, more or less. But Kazui was actually faking being asleep as he goes leaping out of the window with Kon trying to stop him, goes into his Shinigami garb, and then he grabs onto like one of these spirit koi fish or something i'm not I'm not really sure what this is but he just kind of rides it and ends up encountering a lost soul of a guy who's just you know going through some stuff he's dead he's heartbroken and all this kind of stuff i'd say it's weird that a small child is meeting a grown man but i mean it's a ghost it can only do so much and in order to make sure the man isn't lonely he ends up taking this guy and Kon to this weird shrine. And then Kazui performs like almost these rites. And then a door opens. And all of these hell butterflies come flooding out. So it's obviously a portal. But what kind of portal? Because it looks very ominous. Almost like a tear in space. Or the mouth of hell opened up. Because it doesn't look like the Senkaimon. It, it's weird. And Kazui just tells the guy, it's fine. Everyone's in here. Who is everyone? Like, it, it's such an ominous direction to go with this little kid. But then we cut over to the hours earlier where we see Rukia and Renji's kid, Ichika, who I love her name because it's so obvious they named her after Ichigo. And she is a ball of spunk and fire and I love it as she <laughs> she's training with Ikaku. And it's obvious she's not really getting the upper hand, but she tries so many dirty tricks, like pretending to fall and this and that. And Ikaku even teases her about wanting to see Kazui. And it's so obvious she has a little crush on him. But they're interrupted by Yumi Chika because there's a big event going on for a lot of the sh high ranking Shinigami. And this cuts over to Renji actually explaining what's going on to Ichigo. Basically, kind of like a funeral service for a lot of the captains who ended up dying during the big battle, the Thousand Year Blood, Blood War arc battle. And they say that Renji tells Ichigo they already did one for Yamamoto, Unahana, Ukitaki. So I guess this is kind of like a follow-up one or something like that, because I feel like that was all of them. And Renji just passes it off as an old custom. The lieutenants capture a hollow. They end up killing it in front of the graves of those who have passed in front. So they'll be doing it in front of, you know, all the captain's graves. Apparently it's something that happens 12 years after the death of these people, which is a weird amount of time. 12 years. At first I thought it was just a regular funeral procession, a bit of a memorial, but I'm, I'm assuming it's a little bit more than that to help them pass on for the most part. I also love that Ichigo is just casually at Kago's store, which is 
unfortunately failing. I feel so bad for Gago because he just gets no respect and no love. And even uh, Muziro is also there, and it's the typical repertoire where he's just so mean to Kago. Kago's done nothing wrong. And we even have Rukia arrive, um... As Renji's talking to Ichigo, and they start talking about the latest technology and the various different upgrades Ukitaka has given to the Soul Society and all that. As apparently Ruki has been watching a lot of television and learned the lingo of the soap operas and all that good stuff. And as they're praising all the advancements Urahara has made, they're suddenly interrupted by none other than Kurotsuchi in yet another absurd outfit. Like, my god, these outfits are so weird. This is the creepiest looking one yet. And he's actually just projecting through these creepy ass flies to all the various different captains who are around and they're trying to get a hold of their lieutenants. Although I love it because he's projecting to everyone so you get to see a little bit of all the various different divisions you get to see the fourth division where isane and hanataro are completely freaked out by his presence and it's taking Kion to actually be like he's just a hologram just chill out we see the fifth division with shinji and momo with shinji just being like okay that looks Totally creepy. Although Momo, as usual, is very attentive to the message. Ichika also gets home in order to see the message going on. And I swear to God, she says, Oh, it's Captain Kurotsuchi. He's so cool. I'm like, Ichika, no. Baby girl, do not go down that road. Do not go down that road, little girl. And for some reason, Kurotsuchi felt the need to just inform form everyone of the Kansoresai, which is the whole thing that Renji was telling Ichigo about, like, right there and then, and that all of the lieutenants have to gather for it. It's like this ham-fisted way of giving expo exposition, but it's just like, but we already had Renji giving that explanation. But it's also a good way of seeing the various different divisions. We also get to see the first division, mostly the co-lieutenants Nanao and Genshiro, who we haven't really gotten to see, especially considering he's the third seat of the first division. Well, he was the third seat of the first division. So I was actually kind of interested in maybe seeing a little bit more of him in action, as Nanao decides that she'll go in order to collect the hollow while Genshiro stays behind and keeps an eye on Kyoraku. Meanwhile, Suifeng just beats Omaida and tells him to get ready and go. I feel so bad for him. But the real interesting part of these introductions is the fact that we get to the 7th Division, and whereas Iba, whose hairstyle has grown even more out of control, and for some reason I think Kubo forgot to draw Iba's scar that he had on the right side of his face. I mean, I can't expect him to remember everything, but it seems like the only thing he remembered was Iba's pompadour. And we get to see the new lieutenant for the 7th Division, a young man called Rindu Atau, who is actually unable to speak. He's mute, and he communicates with sign language, which is actually pretty cool. And he's a very peaceful, nature-loving kind of guy. It's actually pretty sweet. It's nice to see that. It, it does still make me think, you know, you had all of the visors. I'm surprised more of them didn't distribute themselves amongst the available spots when some of the other people moved up. Like, I'm not saying that Tetsuzaimon doesn't deserve to move up and be a captain, not out loud anyway, but I'm surprised that Love didn't decide to become a captain again. And I'm surprised that Hiori didn't decide to just go under the 8th division or something. I don't know, it seems odd that a few of them decided to just decide to stay outside of the Soul Society, still as kind of renegade visors. 
think they would have at least gotten into like a third seat or something along those lines. I mean, that doesn't mean the others are still visors, but I don't know, it's weird. I, I guess some of them just didn't want to take back on duties. We even get to see Hetsugaya and Rangiku still acting the same as always. It really just feels like a good old return to form, although I feel the worst about the ninth barracks because Hisagi makes a snarky comment about the fact that it's obvious Mayuri is feeling a little self-conscious about the fact that Urihara's made so much stuff and the Mayura hologram fires laser beams out of its eyes to attack Hisagi and I'm just like yo what the fuck it is the most insane thing possible for poor Hisagi. He just can't win. But Ichika overhears this and it's just like, ooh, this is a great time to jump over to the world of the living. So we do just that. We jump over to the world of the living. Interestingly enough, all the cap, all the lieutenants are all gathered together, but Ichigo is also there. As I guess he kind of mixed up what... Renji was trying to tell him, it's just like, no, we lieutenants are supposed to capture the Hollow, you go to Soul Society with the captains. At least I think that's what he was trying to tell him. But we also learn what Ichigo has actually been doing for a profession, and he's a translator, which is actually, I love that. Like, that is so cool. Like, yeah, okay. I mean, it would be. Like, of course. I feel like if Kubo wasn't writing, drawing manga and, you know, doing all this writing, he probably would be a translator. He has an interesting um, love of English for some reason. Ichigo's also introduced to the people he never got to meet before. Basically, the new blood, 1st, 7th Division, Rindo Ato, who is mute but can read lips and all that good stuff. A sweet, quiet guy. And his complete inverse is the 8th Division's Yuyu Yayahara, who is into gang girl fashion and is a complete ganky girl like she is full of too much spirit like and she seems so young too i'm like girl how old are you and it feels like she could only have died recently because she is really all into that kind of you know she feels almost like a millennial or a gen z -er or something like that like she seems young and for some reason when renji brings up that she's lisa's lieutenant he he comes to an understanding and i'm just like okay listen lisa is a little bit off so i Guess she would be the only person capable of dealing with that, but Lisa always struck me as a little bit more irritable when it comes to stuff like that. Although she does tend to read a lot of perverted stuff because she was used to be under Kyoraku, and it's just like, yeah, of course, that kind of makes a bit of sense. There's some weird tastes coming out of both of them, but this, this is a little bit much. And she gets all up close to Ichigo, and she's like, oh, you're Ichigo, the hero from the Great War. And she tries to take some selfies with him and put some filters on it and stuff, and it's just like, this is, this is getting a little crazy. Like, they never should have integrated smartphones with soul pagers. You've gone a step too far. You're encouraging a new generation of degenerates. Meanwhile, Ichigo, Ichika, sorry, I just wanted to say Ichigo, Ichika has managed to make her way to the world of the living just in time for her to, oddly enough, be the only one to see, of all things, what looks like a hell beast just appear behind all of the lieutenants and Ichigo. And Ichika yells out to her dad to for him to notice it's about to attack, and Renji looks away only to be smacked by this hell beast, and he just goes flying. Ichigo handedly just cuts its arms to shreds before it can strike him. And as Hasagi and the others get ready to attack, because they're just like, how did I... They think it's a hollow, and they're just like, how did a hollow get so close only for them not to notice until it's too late as Keon just gets pierced through the gut poor Keon it's just like, it's always one of the girls who end up just being immediately 
gutted out of nowhere. And good on um, Centauro for going in and helping her out, because, I mean, they used to be co-third seed, so of course he would be the one to go in and try to help her out, get her out of the situation. But then all these hell beasts, and I love their des weird design as they have these weird kind of holes on their body, like a couple of holes just protruding like rings out of their body, just free-floating almost. They're so far off of their body, and they, ha they have these chain tattoos across them. And these things are huge. We're talking menos grande huge. And Ikaku's just like, these guys have no spiritual pressure. I don't think they're ordinary hollows or something. So they basically just have to keep battling these things, even though they're supposed to capture a live hollow for the ceremony. Yeah, ceremony's kind of been called off for the most part we also get this awesome scene and I've, I've missed seeing stuff like this just seeing Shinigami in action it has been a hot minute because we actually get to see Rindu actually send out a Shikai and he actually is able to release his Shikai by actually writing on his sword the command give birth and his Shikai is Hawk. And it, as he unleashes his sword, it's like all these... It's the string of almost paper-like talisman, Shinigami or something. And I'm not clear on whether or not Give Birth is the release command or it's the name of his Shikai. And the command is Hawk. I'm wondering, it's been a while since I've actually had to think about this kind of stuff. But he sends out these flurry of hawks that come out of the little paper talismans and they attack one of the hell beasts and just devour it down to the skeleton. It is so cool. What is also cool, I didn't think she was going to be much of anything, but Yagihara goes running up the creature that was devoured down to the skeleton, runs over to another beast, and I guess her Zanpakuto are in her nails, maybe? Because almost like Vixen from DC Comics, you see the image of a bear up here behind her as she uses her nails, which are like, you know, she has fake nails on or something, and she forms them into claws, and like oh, the actual bear just ripping through something, she closes it like a steel trap, and the head of one of these hell beasts just explodes off. And then, unfortunately enough, she also does it to the monster's crotch, which I'm just like, well, it's a good thing this thing doesn't have junk, or else this would be horrifying. But I'm just like, yo, that was actually pretty sick. I'm sorry, that was pretty cool. And despite the fact that he doesn't seem to have a Zanpakuto of his own, at least I don't think so, I think he's wearing one, but he doesn't use it. Akon, you know, the lieutenant for Mayuri, he unleashes what's either science or a keto spell. And as one of the hell beasts get close to him, he just gives out this command after all these numbers melt. And the creature just starts to dissolve into this pool of water he had put down. Or some kind of liquid. And we also get to see Kira and... Ugh, Kira, after what happened in the, to him in the Blood War, it's just... I don't know how to feel about Kira nowadays. Because Izuru, Izuru Kira, he, he lost a huge chunk out of himself, and Mayura treated it by sticking black rods in the hole to keep him upright, and he still seems to have that artificial arm, and he, 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 I don't know how to feel about it now. Because it feels like he doesn't express emotion correctly anymore. But as... Renji makes sure that Ichika is alright and sees to her, makes sure that she's okay. Renji tries to go off and try to handle the rest of the hell beasts, telling Ichika she's going to get an earful once they get home, only for him to be caught by these chains that appear out of a portal, similar to the one that Kazui had made earlier. And so, you know, I'm starting to get the feeling that Kazui has been sending souls to hell as a very familiar figure appears out of the portal to hell. And oddly enough, it's none other than Sayaparo Granz. 
and he has one of those hell beast rings jutting out of his back, almost like a faux halo. And it's just like, of all people to bring back, you brought back Zaylaboro Grans. And he looks around as he's he has wished that Uryu and Kurotsuchi could actually be there, but he's just like, oh, you'll have to do Renchi Abarai. And as Renchi questions, he's just like, aren't you dead? He's just like, yeah. I mean, I was cast into hell. And he's just like, hell is great. You can cast away your hollow self and become this being no longer bound by flesh as a horn, a demon horn, just comes jutting out of his head on both sides. And then Sayaporo tries to grab both Renji and her daughter and drag them into hell. Like, seriously, these chains just come jutting out of the hell gate opening and try to just bury themselves into Renji. Luckily, Ichigo manages to get there in time and just break away all of the chains. And as Sayaparo, Sayalaparo, I always can't say the Sayalaparo part. Sayalaparo grunts, he tries to go in and he's just like, I'm gonna kill you too, Ichigo Kurosaki. And Ichigo's like, who the fuck are you? Meanwhile, with all of the captains, this weird kind of substance starts to appear in the air. And Kyoraku says that it's something called, and I can't, don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Foso, Fosflasm? Fosflasm, I think? I think that's what he's saying, pronouncing. And he says that it's from hell. And he starts to speak of what he calls an old wives' tale of something called the spirit class. About the density of people's spiritual pressure, how it den- it's dense with reishi, how a normal mom- member of a court card squad would have a certain amount of reishi, fairly on the low side. You'd have a lieutenant who'd be of a fourth or fifth class. And, you know, theirs would be a little bit higher. And anybody with a reishi level that is third class or above usually are captain. And when a soul's, soul reaper's body passes on, or when they die, they become reishi and become part of the soul society. However, anybody with a third class spiritual pressure is apparently too dense to just become reishi and be absorbed into the soul society. And the ceremony that they're trying to perform, the Konso Reisai, is supposed to allow them to dissipate their reishi and just have it become one with the soul society. However, he says that the old wives' tale is that the reishi doesn't dissipate. Third class and above can never actually become part of the soul society. In fact, what happens to them, what happens to the captains that they're performing this right for, they're cast into hell. And Sailaparo is telling this to Ichigo, and it's just like, wait, we've been casting the captains into hell? They just, they just get cast into hell? No, what, what? No! No! That's pretty fucked up if that's the case. And Sayaparo makes it sound like because they gain so much power, the likes of Ukiha, Ukatake, Unahana, Genryu Sai, because of the great power that they had, that they wielded, that power was too much for them to just dissipate and become nothing, and so they were cast into hell, because that was the only place to put them. And normally, with other powerful people on the other side, that kept, keeps the gates of hell shut from allowing these more powerful creatures from being unleashed. And Sailaparo makes it sound like, because of the fact that Ichigo had taken care of the lights of Aizen and Yoach, the balance had been fed too much in the direction of Hell, and so Hell's mouth has just come flying open to be able to unleash all these demonic creatures, because those captains, they have too much power to just become reincarnated and move on to the afterlife, which is actually fascinating. It like, makes me wonder, like, is that gonna happen to Ichigo when he dies? What happens when Ichigo dies? He's a human. And the thought that, you know, they've possibly been sending their comrades to hell is a very 
fucked up premise, like, it, it just goes to show the Soul Society is just broken as shit. Like, I thought it was bad before, but this adds a whole nother layer to how fucked up the Soul Society actually is. And Kyoraku is just like, okay, if this is happening now, because all those powerful people died, that's a very ominous realization. And Sailapro is just like, my appearance is proof. Ichigo, the balance has collapsed. There's no more balance. And Sailapro says that, yeah, they're all down in hell. Court guard founder Yamamoto Gen Yuisai, the death sword Retsu Unahana. And the way he phrases it is that today was the day that... Ukitake would be cast into hell. But it's weird because all of a sudden the gates of hell appear behind Sailapro, and all of a sudden Ukitake's Soge ko Soge yo no Kotowari. There we go. Soge yo no Kotowari. His sword in its Shikai state just comes out piercing through Silapro, much like we saw when we first saw the gates of hell, and that demon came through and just skewered Shrieker and sent him straight to hell. And apparently the ceremony to, you know, send Ukitaki to hell was finished the moment all of those hell beasts were slain, despite the fact that they're not hollow. And then uh, before he's dragged back in, into hell, Silaparo says, Hell has always been beside all of you. Haven't you ever noticed why the butterflies that guide the Soul Reaper between the Soul Society and the Land of the Living are called Hell Butterflies? And with that, the gates of Hell close. And back when Kazui was performing that little rite to send that guy where we now know as Hell, these eyeballs kind of appeared first. And those same eyeballs now appear in the eye sockets of the two skeletons holding the gates of hell. So, yeah, Kazui's been sending people to hell. And the last shot we see as all of this concludes, you know, is Kazui, fresh off of sending that man to hell, running down the street following hell butterflies. It is so fucked up. It is so fucked up, but it's also really kind of cool and really morbid, and I loved it. Like, Bleach is back, baby. I don't know how often this is going to be. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, much like Burn the Witch, it's just like, every year I'll put something out when I feel like it, basically. <laughs> That's how this is going to go. When Kubo feels like it, he'll release something. Because we really didn't receive any information on any of this. It just kind of happened. She's like, Bleach is releasing something. Come get it, you dirty bastards. And that's the end of it. But it was really good. And it's nice to see Kubo getting back into the swing of things. I know he, you know, the end of Bleach came because Kubo was burnt out. Honestly, it really does feel like Kubo was just burnt out. He just wasn't willing to do this anymore. He just wanted it to end, and thus he ended it. You know, Shonen Jump was tired. He was gyred. He It was done. But it looks like he's just ready to come back and just keep writing stories for Bleach of all things. And I really do have to wonder if there will be any overlap with Burn the Witch. Because Burn the Witch is supposed to take place a about 10 years after the end of the original series and two years after the end of the epilogue and depending where this chapter falls in it's a possibility Kazui doesn't look too much older though than at the end of the series so it's really hard to say but I mean that's all the way over in London so there's no guarantee we'll have any of that. It would be cool, though. The Soul Society and the uh, 
western branch of the Soul Society have to team up. I guess it would be the eastern branch and the western branch. But dealing with Hell Beast now. Oh man, that 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 would actually be pretty cool. I'm interested to see where this goes. Although there's no guarantee on how long it's going to go or when it's all even going to be updated, so I'm not going to get my hopes up for any of this. I'm interested, I'm happy that it's happening, but I'm not going to freak out about it and get my hopes up. Like, cool, awesome, moving on. <laughs> but Kubo brought his A game. I'm glad for that much, at least. I can't wait to see what he does next, whether it's Burn the Witch or more Bleach. Can't wait for the return of the anime. And uh, should we be concerned about Kazui? Like, is Kazui an agent of destruction and chaos? Has he been feeding souls to hell? Is this the result of... Ichigo and all the power he obtained just passing on to his son, it really does make me wonder. Let me know your thoughts and theories in the comment section below. You know, three of the most powerful captains, now agents of hell? Is that a good thing? Should be we worried? I mean, you know, Ukitake's sword came out and brought Salaparo back to hell. Is that a good thing? We really don't know much about Hell. Hell, even the Hellverse movie didn't tell us much about Hell. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing here really seems to contradict Hellverse intensely. You know, surprise, surprise, the movie isn't canon. Which is unfortunate. It was one of the better Bleach movies. But it's been 10 years since that movie, so not surprising. But I really do have to wonder, is anything really going to come out of this? Is this the grand return of Bleach with the anime on the way next year? I mean, this might be the thing. Bring it all back. Get us back into the swing of our bleach-loving days. Or maybe this is just a fading memory that'll be here one day and gone the next. Only time will tell. But tell me your thoughts in the comment section below. What did you think about this special chapter? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Do you think they could have done better? I'm interested to hear from you. And if you like this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications. And until next time, I've been Deuce This Then, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.